in the chat that, thank you, that during the, the Q&A, the recording will be paused. Thank you. Next slide. Uh, here's a, a, a um, screenshot of our agenda today. We're going to do welcome and introductions, and we're going to next move quickly into an overview of data collection and availability across Texas, internet adoption in Texas, and the future of ACP. I know that there is a lot of um, information going around, and we're going to do a deep dive on ACP for you all today, and where do we go from here, and then we'll move to the Q&A session. So I'm going to uh, Turn it over to Sean, who's going to introduce himself. We've got three presenters today, myself, Sean, and Christine. Sean's going to introduce himself, and then Christine's going to introduce herself, and then we'll move to the presentation. All right. Hey, everyone. Uh, Sean Gonsalves. I am uh, a senior writer for communitynets.org, which is the um, ILSR's Community Broadband Networks Initiative website. Um, and I'm also the associate director for communications for the community broadband's team. Hello, everyone. I'm Christine Parker. I'm the Senior GIS Analyst for the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, um, and I'm based in Maine. Uh, and I will be getting our presentation started today. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we're going to start with a little bit of a background on broadband maps. Um, for anybody that is, hasn't been keeping up with the drama of the national broadband map over the past couple of years, um, there is a lot that, entail, that goes with this, um, but I'm going to kind of stick to the most salient points in terms of the history, um, issues that came up with the new map, and some resources um, uh, that I can share with you all, um, for, especially for anyone that's interested in uh, getting into data and mapping work um, as we move through uh, this next chapter of broadband development. Um, next slide. And so if you haven't seen it before, this is the new um, FCC National Broadband Map. Um, it was released in November of 2022 and is a uh, location level resource of uh, broadband availability. Next slide. Um, but before we kind of get into uh, more detail about the map. Um, I wanted to talk about the transition itself. So um, the previous map, um, when I'm saying like new versus old maps, um, the previous map um, illustrated broadband availability at the census block level. So it's a small geography, think of it like a, a city block. Um, and there are some problems that came along with this map. One was that uh, provider data was generally overreported, not necessarily by fault of the ISPs, but inherently by how it was reported. So if within a census block, one location was served by a provider, the whole block was considered served by the provider. So with that in mind, you can imagine there's you know, gross overreporting across the country, as well as overreporting of competition among providers across the country. So this was problematic. And so there was this um, impetus to move toward a more uh, detailed map system. Um, so if we take a couple steps back now from the, from the, the new map, um, we're going to March 2022. Um, CostQuest Associates uh, is a private uh, telecommunications mapping and consulting firm. And they were hired by the FCC um, to create what is known as the fabric. So this is a, um, think of it as like a, a national address database. Um, and this would serve as the template over which internet service providers would report their availability data. And uh, this product, the fabric, uh, had a price tag of $50 million. And it was super surprising to everybody to discover that the fabric could only be accessed after executing a license agreement with CostQuest. And then uses for the fabric were limited um, to submitting availability data, as well as submitting challenges to the map. So this is one additional, in addition to the location level reporting, the new map also uh, enables anyone, um, me at my house in Maine, um, folks in Texas, any kind of entity could challenge data that is in this new map. In the old map, if you had a problem with it, there wasn't much you could do about it. But now you can actually you know, look at your location, see if the address information is correct, see if the um, ISP, what they're claiming to be able to provide that data is correct. If it's not, you can 
you can uh, submit a challenge um, to get that corrected. Um, and so fast forwarding back to November, the map is released. Uh, next slide. And this is the most important statistic you need to know today. <laughs> For anyone that looks at this map, as you're interacting with it, if you feel confused about it, you are not alone. I feel like most people, when they initially looked at this map, and until today, um, I still work with people and I give talks about how to use this map and how to interpret what you're seeing in the map. It is not intuitive. Um, and there is a lot there, but it's just not well, it's an, it's not well designed still. Um, it is improving. There have been, you know, we're on our third version of it now. And so there have been improvements over time. Um, but I feel like this is a good level setting statistic I like to share with folks as we, as we talk about this map. Next slide. Thank you. Um, so, uh, you know, leading up to the release of this map, there was a lot of chatter um, about the policy driving it, um, about the data, what we would see in this map, what was going to be availab available to people. Likewise, with the challenges um, that were going to be allowed and how you could challenge um, and the process involved with that. Um, there was a lot of there were a lot of unknowns with this new process, and so I I was able to keep up to speed with this um, in a monthly call uh, with the National Broadband Mapping Coalition. And so this is a group that is hosted by the Marconi Society. Um, it's a really great call for anyone that of any experience level really that wants to get up to speed on all issues related to broadband mapping, um, and you know participation or um, uh, Membership is free, you know, you just sign up, register to join the calls, and um, it's got, you know, folks from every corner of the broadband digital equity space from academia and universities to, you know, private small ISPs, um, just folks that are interested in it from their own community perspective, um, really anyone can join. And from this group, I actually was able to make a few um, they kind of core make a core friend group of sorts of with people that were had a very similar keen interest in broadband data and mapping. And um, we have called ourselves broadband commons and our mission is to just make broadband data access easier for anybody that wants to work with it. Um, because working accessing the the raw data behind this map um, and doing things with it, processing it is um, pretty labor intensive now because it's, you know, it's at the location level. So there's a lot of it. Um, and so we've uh, started a book, um, which is kind of an ongoing iteration um, that we're working on. And we've also created some different tools, um, both of which are freely available to folks to check out and um, and the tools you can actually modify if you know if you want to uh, change change and modify to your own specific needs. Um, that's totally cool. And so these people um, are always happy to chat with folks. And um, if you have questions, you can certainly reach out to me, and I can connect you with um, you know appropriate people if you're interested in in doing something data related. So now we kind of set the stage. We've got this national map. And if we zoom in on Texas, um, this map, I've taken that location level data and aggregated it, aggregated it at the census block level. And so what uh, this is illustrating is the percent of locations per census block that only have access to uh, speeds less than 100 over 20 megabits per second. Um, so orange colors, you know, there's a lot more locations that need better service, essentially, um, which is a large swath of Texas. You can see the more blue areas are areas where you've got a greater population density. Um, you know, it, it makes sense, but these areas in orange desperately need better connectivity. Next slide. Um, and if we take, this is data uh, summarized from a different data set from the American Community Survey, which is uh, collected by the Census Bureau. This is um, a response to a question about uh, internet subscriptions. And uh, the, in this answer, folks reported that they had no internet access at their household. Um, and so this map kind of, this is at the county level um, and kind of gives a, you know, a similar vibe, like a lot of rural Texas um, 
does not have internet access and especially looking at that south southwestern border area next slide um for those people who do use internet access um this is also this is from the ntia internet use survey um and this is these are uh, data just for texas um there's a real wide variety of uses um that people are you know that have for the internet and so it, it there isn't anything that's like really standing out from these uses it's like pretty distributed um and so with that in mind, when you look at the next slide, um, it might seem surprising that the biggest response to this question of why um, a household, no one in a household uses internet at home is that there's no need and no interest. Um, and so this feels baffling, right? Um, well, this is certainly an, a valid interest for, or a valid reason for some people. Um, there are social scientists who focus on the development of these questions, and they suggest that the format of the question and the order of these responses, because these are the options people are given when they're asked those question, um, this creates a bloated response because they don't necessarily wanna think about the detail of why they don't use the internet it's easy to just say no need, no interest. And that's the first option that they get to. So um, that's that could be what's going on here. But more importantly, I want to focus on the second major factor here, which is that internet is too expensive. Next slide. Um, and so the affordability of internet was made super apparent during the pandemic. We all know that. And the FCC stood up the affordable connectivity program very quickly in an effort to get folks back online and back to school work, et cetera. Um, currently, currently we have over 23 million households enrolled nationally, which is 43% of those households that are eligible to be enrolled. Um, in Texas, uh, 1.6 million are enrolled, which is 38% of the households that are eligible. So not too far below that national figure. Um, and if we uh, take a look next slide at the back at that county map again, you can see the areas um, with highest enrollment, which are in shades of blue, match up pretty well with the this county map of households that are reporting no internet access. Next slide. And so to me, um, this suggests a few things. One is that people do want to get online. People do need financial assistance and service plans that are available may not be affordable. So if they're reporting there's no internet access in a place, it may not necessarily be the infrastructure is not there. I mean, we know there are places that are sincerely lacking infrastructure, but affordability is an important part of um, accessibility. So that is um, something I, I think is really important to keep in mind as we're talking about um, internet access. And I will hand it over to Sean. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Affordability indeed, um, as we've talked about in many of the previous uh, modules, um, how how important that is to um, solving this issue and how important it is to the Texas Digital Opportunity Plan. And frankly, all um, uh, state plans like that across the country um, really relies on the Affordable Connectivity Program as being a key part of uh, bridging that gap. Now, what you're looking at here is a screenshot of the dashboard that um, Christine, our GIS specialist, was just who was just on, had a tremendous hand in creating and updating. Uh, but this dashboard, um, so let's just talk for, first a little bit about the origin of the ACP, um, which was, as Christine alluded to earlier, I don't know if there's any good thing that's come out of the pandemic. I can't think of one. Although one silver lining maybe, perhaps, is suddenly um, would everyone realize how important uh, high-speed internet connectivity was. Uh, something that folks that have been in the space for a long time have been saying for a long time, but I think the pandemic really underscored that. And so in that um, in, in that time period, uh, with the Re with the American Rescue Plan Act, which was essentially a, a, a response to the pandemic, um, one of the things that it was created was the emergency broadband benefit, which at that time it gave a $75 a month um, voucher 
for, to get folks online immediately, um, which was super important. The Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act comes along, the bipartisan, bipartisan infrastructure bill comes along and says, we're going to take the EBB, where we're going to change it into the Affordable Connectivity Program, which nominally would be a, uh, you know, a program moving forward. However, um, in the infrastructure bill, the ACP was funded with $14.2 billion. It was a one-time allocation. And so the dashboard that you're looking at essentially was born out of the question that we had on our team, which is how long will those funds last? And so this dashboard here, and Christine can jump in at any time to um, elaborate or, or, or correct me, but th this dashboard was created to track ACP enrollment, uh, the, the rate at which the funds would be spent, um, and the... Uh, projected, uh, and, and the numbers in here, we use the uh, Universal Service Administration numbers. Those are the folks who keep the numbers of enrollees, et cetera, um, in the program. This is a, a, a dashboard, acp-dashboard.com uh, that's updated a couple times a month, um, twice a month, I believe, um, when the numbers are released. Um, and so it, 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 it tracks, for example, um, everything down to the zip code level of, of who's enrolled in ACP. Um, and you can see at the bottom right-hand corner, the $694 million number, that's basically the monthly burn rate of the ACP. You see there's $2.9 billion left. So according to our dashboard, this fund will run out of money in April. And next slide. Uh, it turns out that um, the funds are running out in April. Um, and so we're in this, oh, uncertain situation where, so last week, the Federal Communications Commission, who is in charge of administering the, the program, announced that they were preparing to wind the program down. Um, and without their, you know, there's nothing really on the horizon of a legislative fix, except the ACP Extension Act had been introduced. There's a bipartisan group of senators and congressional representatives who have introduced this act, um, requesting, I believe, $7 billion, which is about what we would need to keep the program running until the end of the year. Um, the bill's prospects, frankly, are not good. Um, you know, reading the tea leaves is not um, something that I do. Um, but, you know, by all accounts, it doesn't look like that bill will be passed before uh, the program runs out of funds. And so, therefore, the Federal Communication Commission is beginning this um, wind down process. Um, and 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 one of the things that needs to happen is. Many groups and, and we would be among them are would be you know um advocating for the acp extension act to pass so that the program could be funded until uh the end of the year but there needs to be a long-term funding solution for acp and so there's a number of ideas one of which um a number of, of folks agree on is the idea that the universal services fund which essentially is this perpetual but dwindling pot of money that comes from essentially subsidizing landline service over the years. There is a call for that to be modernized. And some folks have some interesting ideas about how you could sort of modernize the lifeline program essentially um, to um, serve as the funding source for a new ACP. Next slide. So a couple of key things that are happening right now is that, um, the um the uh the ACP um uh the FCC is uh freezing enrollment on um uh ACP new enrollees in ACP on February 7th prior to we, we when we get to down to these real critical dates the FCC is hosting a uh public briefing on January 18th, as you can see here at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So maybe we'll learn a bit more. Um, right now, the um, the FCC is in the process of, you know, they've published guidelines on how the ACP should be un unrolled. 
um, if if this extension act isn't passed, um, we can go to the next slide. Um, these are the important dates to remember as we move forward. So February 7th is the date that the ACP, um, the FCC has already announced that they will accept no new enrollees. Now, it's a separate question as to enrolling at this particular time, given the uncertainty of the program. But if there are people that you are looking to enroll or people who are, el or, are interested to enroll, if they do not enroll and get approval before February 7th, they won't be considered for the ACP program. That's an important date. Late January. So the FCC has said that the um, ISPs who participate in the Affordable Connectivity Program need to give out at least three notices um, to um, subscribers who are uh, in the ACP program. The first notice should go out probably late this month followed by two other notices. And these notices are supposed to contain information as to the impact of the plan running out. Uh, there's rules around specifically having folks opt in um, as to sort of um, uh, mitigate against service disruptions and folks being stuck with large bills, et cetera. Um, so there's supposed to be three notices that go out um, before what the FCC is now saying is the funds will run out projected April of this month. So we're talking what three, three or four months from now. And so now we are transitioning into this period of uncertainty where we have to start thinking about how to move forward. Uh, should the ACP program, um, the funds be depleted and it not be uh, re no more funds are uh, reallocated by Congress. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Deanne, who can tell us a bit about um, how we are, we're transitioning. Thanks. Thanks, Sean. Um, I'm going to recap on some more dates. So here are some other anticipated ACP wind down dates that you'll notice that they're almost all starred because this is assuming that a last fully funded month of April 2024. Uh, quick highlights is the uh, January 25th, which is the first of the three notices that Sean mentioned. So that is in a couple of weeks. The first notice that will be going out to the public is uh is scheduled for January 25th if nothing changes. And then you have uh, late February with anticipated timing. And it takes us all the way up to May. If if there, uh, the May date is important to note because if people are still enrolling in new ACP participants and if there is any funding remaining, then the partial provider claims for discounted service, you know, would, would be able to fund some or all with depending on how much money is available. Next slide. So where do we go from here? Back to that question. Um, lots of lots of geographies, including um, geographies here within the state of Texas, regions, or we'll call them, are uh, considering forming um, organically or officially what we're calling ACP transition teams. So um, if you remember back, we talked a lot about these uh, key points and top line messages about what that looks like to work with multiple stakeholders, cross sectoral stakeholders. And so we at ILSR have pulled together some step-by-step -step tips to consider if this is what you're gonna be doing in your region, if you have or you don't have a coalition or an alliance. So the key point number one is coordination. Always be identifying the key st stakeholders within you know, your community, even if you're frontier rural or if you're a high density area like, um, like Houston, Texas, make sure that you're including representatives of IS, um, the internet service providers, ISPs, because ISPs are part of the uh, ecosystem at large when it comes to the um, ACP program. And then community organizations and affected households. And you always want to be pivoting back to that Digital Equity Act list of covered populations if you don't know where to start when you're thinking about affected households. And then also, we, we think right now our best advice is to notify and assist outreach you know, uh, grant awardees now instead of waiting. Some uh, organizations, some private and public funding has actually gone into helping communities do outreach and digital navigator programs to get people enrolled. We think that notice should be going out as soon as possible to those people. Next slides. 
Communication is key. If you remember the digital TV transition, we had to over communicate what was happening. We had to reach out to communities multiple times every day, all day, PSAs, by text, by phone, by email, and by printed uh, materials. If you refer back to one of the slides that Sean shared, the uh, first meeting that was today that was led by the FCC's outreach team pointed to that email address that you can request printed materials. They'll mail them to you now if you reach out to them and tell them the number of printed materials that you need. If that's not something you can create for your community, there's materials that have already been created in multiple languages. There is an accessibility line that has been established. So they are moving pretty quickly. Um, you just have to refer to that email address that we've listed or the phone number that's on that webinar slide. They can also call them and speak directly with the ACP transition team that the FCC has formed. So communication is key. Um, if you're waiting for those materials to come in, there is a affordable connectivity program wind down fact sheet that has lots of this information we pulled directly from the FCC's website, the FCC's webinar, and the FCC's fact sheet for today, even though that first meeting was today. So you're getting the most up-to-date information by participating in today's webinar. You yourself need to take, uh, sorry, go back. You yourself have to take um, that material and make it relevant for the communities you're working with. So whatever communications plans you have had in place to be doing enrollment, now is the time to be updating those materials. And, um, you know, like I said, over communicating. Next slide. Um, and my favorite slide is collaboration. Collaboration. Collaboration and collaboration is key. Uh, now is not the time to um, now is not the time to be deciding like who you will and won't work with um, in your community, regardless of where you are in the state. We have to go across every region, making sure that everybody is involved in the tra transition. Now is an excellent time to be bringing in stakeholders and leaders and decision makers who you would like to work with with the projects that are underway now or the projects that you're planning in the future. Um, this is where you can actually be co-creating solutions with what is happening organically through this transition. There, um, I don't have it listed in, on this slide today, but there is a lot of storytelling and a lot of information that's being documented by people in the field who have been enrolling households. And so that information could help you at a later time. I also put like establish a local base uh, building model you know, what that means is your community is going to have to figure out how you want to coordinate and, and bring people together. I'm going to share like a highlight of what we're thinking about where, where I'm located. Um, but in the end, you also want to be thinking about in the future when the Texas Digital Opportunity Plan and the Texas Broadband Development Office is able to issue more guidance about their capacity grant program. That is in the future, but it's in the near future, right? And so we know right now with the ACP transition team, a lot of this collaboration and coordination could help lead to successes later on down the line. So this is why I have that. Establish how you're going to uh, collaborate and coordinate locally, and then start thinking about how you're going to pursue state and federal funding through these conversations that are, and, the, and the work that's being done during the ACP transition. And then you um, lastly, I'm going to highlight this again because we do almost every presentation. Make sure that the set of goals that you are creating in your community don't have to adhere to every single word, but those goals that you are setting in your community, you know, should should have an affinity to the five goals laid out in the TDOP. And if they don't, you want to revisit why. And understanding the TDOP funding sources will help go a long way. Next slide. So just to recap. Um, I'm I'm calling this uh, we're calling this like the, those of us in you know in the Alamo area that are you know thinking through this with the latest information you know beyond ACP and so those are the the three you know top line messages is that we want to encourage local communities to coordinate uh, to communicate often and to collaborate. Uh, I'm this is a, a map that Christine created for me of Bear County. The reason why I'm showing you a, more of a zoomed in version of the Bear County area is that a, one of the questions I often get about um, collaboration and coordination is like where to start if the funding and the resources are not there. And so this map here in the blue shows this, shows us here in Bear County in San Antonio, like where the highest enrollments are. So we can look at this map 
and quickly pivot our advocacy towards focusing on those areas and then re responding accordingly because we we have this information we know that there is flaws in using um, census data or any kind of public information, but this is this is a pragmatic way of you know hitting the ground running with your local community and having conversations with high level decision makers about what comes next beyond ACP. Next slide. We are at a really good place today because of the map. This kind of a big conversation around mapping and access gaps communicating the issue and ACP, you know, being on a high mind, we really want to dedicate a lot of time today to um, let y'all uh, offer questions uh, to uh, Christine and Sean and myself. We're calling it an Ask Me Anything, but it's really a Q&A session. So I'm going to remind you all that you can put questions in the chat and we'll collect them there. Of course, if it is, you know, if questions are the same, we'll probably consolidate them into one. And we are going to stop recording for the Q&A session. We'll bring it back to close. And then we are going to open it up, unmute. And uh, we will, uh, I will be moderating today. So I'm probably not going to be answering as many questions as Sean's Christine. But please take a moment to think about um, what you might want to ask. And we, in the meantime, We'll keep the poll up for those of y'all who have entered. Please refer to the poll, move it over if you need to, and we will stop the recording and then we'll get going. Thank you. So just a reminder, I wanna thank my colleagues, Christine and Sean for joining us today. I wanted to share this beautiful quote for, that Christine found for us. We wanna thank you all and we hope the maps are good where you are. It's from Paying Shepherd of the Cartographers. Here is a reminder of the office hours, Monday, 1 to 3 p.m., Thursdays, 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. And just a reminder that these are central time for us. These slides and the video will be uploaded shortly after today's call. And um, if, it's, if it, there's a link that's been shared or a resource that's been shared in this presentation today, it will be clickable and available through the slides. So and thank you so much for joining us today and we can't wait to see you at the next one.